preliminary work is really a huge and um, invisible portion of construction. There's no lumber in the air, there's no dirt being moved, but there's a lot of work being done. Everything about engineering, about design, about permits and applications takes time. You're never going to get anything back from a qualified engineer in less than two or three weeks. If you do, it's because he doesn't have enough work because his reputation is not strong enough to have enough workload and frankly you need somebody who's busy within a certain tolerance. So we've waited for the soils report. We've got it. It was worth waiting for. Now we're going to engage with a design engineer for the structural uh, retaining conditions. That'll take a while. We're going to get input out there around this process just as fast as we can. Thanks for your patience. So we're moving forward with this project again because I have received back from Carl Broda the geotechnical report. He did his analysis. He made his investigation. He ran his calculations. He shot the grades on the slopes analyzed um, the soil compaction, analyzed the shear value of the soils, analyzed the soil types and the, the subsurface and surface water conditions, and he made his recommendations with supporting calculations, which is something you have to have if the engineer that designs the retaining walls and the foundation is going to be able to do it other than just with a hip shot best guess. Now on some building sites, this is not a big deal because they're flat and they're stable and water is not intruding and you just build something, but not on this place. That would be a huge mistake here to assume that this pad, which is a combination of cut and fill, is stable enough to support a structure evenly. So Mr. Broda has provided an excellent service. You'll notice right here is his stamp. What that stamp does, besides declaring his qualification, is it also implies another level to your safety net. Because when you have an engineer with a stamp, you also have a liability insurance policy standing behind his calculations. Now, nobody ever wants to use that. But that is certainly one of the reasons that municipalities and jurisdictions and contractors need to see a stamp. Because that means that it is not just the professional and the consumer of his service that has an interest in the accuracy of his calculations and of his recommendation, but in fact a liability insurance policy, which in a worst case scenario is a wonderful thing to have. But anyway, the value here, he charged me $2,225. Now that's a nice even number, isn't it? And that may be appalling to you, it shouldn't be. It may be, in fact, the best money that we will spend on this project because it understands, it provides a way to understand conditions that would be devastating if they're not understood and can only be understood, really understood, by someone who has the expertise. I'm happy to have spent that. I feel like I got good value. So he has, you know, sort of boilerplate stuff about purpose and scope, and then he starts to soil stability analysis. That's important. And at the end, he provides his recommendations on how to retain, that is hold up, keep in place the edges of this lot and how to prepare the middle of the lot where the structure will bear to hold up the weights that a wood frame residential structure imposes on a foundation. So this is the west side of the lot. I'm standing on a cut. A cut is when the grading equipment cut the dirt off of the ground that is left exposed at the surface. A fill is where that uh, transported, that shifted dirt came to rest and creates part of the building pad that was not naturally occurring but rather was put into place by the equipment. Cut, fill. Cut is hard, right? This is as hard as, as uh, it was when God built it. That, the fill, is however hard the excavation contractor made it by mechanical compaction, which in this case is not hard at all. They, they put the appearance of compaction on this lot rather than the reality. That's part of what we're fixing. But on this west side, you see we've got a slope here. It ranges from about 35% to 60% coming across the west side of this lot. My conversation with Mr. Broda, we decided that what we're going to do is cut the toe of this slope back, you know, six, eight 
feet, something like that. Get another eight feet of flat space that I can use for the house. We'll put a six to eight foot retaining wall, cast in place concrete retaining wall against that slope, backfill it with drain rock so that the water that comes down that hill drops behind the retaining wall, is transported out to the south end of the lot and then transported out to the street. So the first thing that's been determined is going to move the toe of the slope back, pull out some of that shale, put in a nice little retaining wall. This is going to be a fairly easy slope to retain because it's stable. It's not cut. It's hard. Um, this And it's easy to get to, right? I mean, this is going to be really the first piece of concrete work that we start in on. One of the interesting things is you always try, when you're dealing with excavation, particularly in a confined space, to balance the grade. That is, anything that you dig out, hopefully you're able to put into another location on site and not have to export. Export means put the dirt in a truck, haul it somewhere, and unload it. That costs money. So we're trying to balance the grade here. That is, whatever moving of soils, whatever digging and shifting, everything hopefully will stay on site. To accommodate that and to improve the drainage away from the house, we're going to raise the grade of the pad about 18 inches. So the house sits up a little higher so that we can control the compaction in that 18 inches. It'll reduce how much remedial work we have to do in the existing grade. It'll get a better view. It'll provide the latitude for the water to run away from the house better. It's uh, rule of thumb. It's always better to lift your structures. It gets it away from the water. And water is what destroys buildings. I'm standing about on the property line on the south side of the lot. This is the problematic side. You can see that there's a, a slope here. You know, it's 60% it's every bit of that. I've got about a 16 foot grade drop between the buildable elevation of my lot and the, the buildable elevation of the adjoining lot. This slope, once it gets away from the cut portion, is soft. And more importantly, it's intruding on the neighbor. I've got to move this back. The decision about how to retain this slope is a big part of the curb appeal of this house. So I'm going to come up with a cast-in-place retaining wall about eight feet. I am going to, from the eight-foot level on up to the, oh, probably 12 to 14-foot level, it's going to be a rockery wall lodged behind the top of the retaining wall, going back at about a one to two slope, coming up four to six feet. That's going to make a nice texture contrast between the cast-in-place wall and the rockery wall, and then it will slope up as yard space up to the elevation of the house. So all the way down this south line, as you can see it's pretty serious, we're going to be putting in a cast-in-place wall and the rockery over the top. Most of the work is going to happen right here. Part of the work that happens here is to benefit the adjoining neighbor, separate from the harm that this fill is on him. I, he and I, I think, are going to do some cost share because I have a chance here, he has a chance here to improve his lot by increasing the footprint of his buildable space while I'm here doing the work anyhow. So this is another um, skill set that is handy to have when you're in a subdivision, is knowing how to get along with your neighbors understand what their needs are, help them understand what your needs are, hope that you are both reasonable people and be able to come to a mutually beneficial arrangement on the big ticket items that are daunting and are best dealt with cooperatively, congenially, in a way that will promote a neighborhood rather than a, an assortment of warring factions. So don't forget this, it's part of building in a neighborhood. Now I'm standing on the southeast corner you're looking west. This is the other end of that slope that we were just talking about where most of the work is going to happen. I hope you can see that that is a serious slope. This is the corner where that this retaining condition that is restraining the south end that is running east and west will turn and run north and south to retain the east side of the building pad. The retaining condition on this side is going to get shorter as the grade comes up, but it's going to be the same system. Cast in place for eight feet or so, rockery on top. This will terminate at a stairway that runs up. One of the um, considerations 
in construction generally and specifically and especially in excavation and concrete is staging the work. Where are you going to put the equipment? Where are you going to stack the dirt? Where are the dump trucks going to come in? Where are they going to dump? Something that people don't understand is that 80% of construction is handling material. Now people say, wait a minute, construction is about measurement, it's about layout, it's about grades, it's about connections, it's about joinery, it's about cutting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 80% of construction is just handling the material efficiently, which is why construction workers' backs hurt, okay? Everything is about handling material. But in any case, we're going to have to stage the material for this excavation, remediation, and retaining on the neighbors, up on the top of this pad, probably up and down, just back of curb. It's going to be a bit of a problem because it's a constrained site, but I think we're going to make it. I'm relieved now to finally have the scope and the, the method that I'm going to bring to the design, the structural engineer, and say, here, design this for me. An engineer needs that from a, from a contractor, from an owner an idea of what they want to sort of put parameters around where the engineer needs to start focusing his effort. It's like a doctor. You go to a doctor, you have to tell him what's wrong. You have to tell him what you would like your life to be so that he can apply his expertise to fixing whatever your problem is. An engineer is the same way. So in any case, here we go. It's just about time to actually put the pencil to the paper and make the design, start to make the marks and think the thoughts and commit myself to a course of direction that are going to determine the outcome of this project. Thanks for watching.